Well, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, my name is Maureen Helm. I'm a software engineer at NXP. Um, I've been working on the Zephyr project uh, for about a year and a half now, um, maybe a little bit longer than that, since we, we launched last year at Event World. Um, so today I wanted to come and talk to you guys about um, how we're using vendor house in the Zephyr project. Um, the last, I think it was the last ELC, maybe the previous one, we had a number of people that were asking questions about why are we doing this, what's, what's the, you know, value in bringing in um, vendor house into the project excuse me, into the project. So um, this is kind of a follow-up to that action and, and to give you guys a little bit more insight into what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. So to start off, um, just a, a quick introduction about what the Zephyr project is for those of you that maybe aren't quite as familiar with it. Um, the Zephyr project is an open source project hosted by the Linux Foundation targeting small footprint RTOSes. So things like microcontrollers um, that can scale down into devices that have single digits or, or, or so of kilobytes of flash and RAM and anywhere up um, that you might be interested in going. Um, it's a cross-architecture project and so we have participation from a number of different um, companies uh, across architecture. So it's not just the ARM ecosystem but also x86, um, ARC, RISC-V, Extensa architectures. And so we have a lot of collaboration coming from different companies and different vendors um, all coming together to, to build a, a common RTOS for microcontrollers. So the, the Zephyr ecosystem, we can kind of look at it in sort of three different levels. Um, starting at the, the, the Zephyr OS itself, um, this is the core scheduling kernel, um, the threading model, uh, device, or excuse me, driver models um, that we have for um, sort of the lowest level of, of hardware enablement. Um, <clears throat> So that includes things like platform-specific drivers, I.O. APIs, file systems, uh, networking and connectivity, so TCP IP, Bluetooth, things like that. Um, and so that, that's what we, we think of when we talk about the Zephyr OS. So it's not just the, sort of the vendor part, um, but it's also building up um, middleware stacks um, that we all need and have in common. Um, Come, going from the OS to the project, um, we have a number of, of tools and, and, and host SDKs that we use to help make it easier for the developer to, to, to build Zephyr. Um, so things like cross-compilers and um, additional features like that. So, and lastly, then there's the Zephyr community. So things are that, that we would think of as, as, as partner projects or that are things that are building on top of Zephyr. Um, that's where um, you know we kind of branch out into things like Zephyr.js and MicroPython and IOTivity and other projects like that that kind of build on that framework that we that we construct in Zephyr. So, um, so my talk today is covering at the kind of the lowest level here. Um, I don't have a pointer, but um, so the lowest level um, underneath the kernel and the the driver model. Um, so, why are we using Zephyr? Why are we using vendor HALs and, and what exactly are they um, in, in the, this particular case? So the vendor HALs that we have um, at, the, at the very lowest level give us core and peripheral register definitions. And so a lot of these SOCs have hundreds or thousands even um, different registers, register fields, and things like that. Um, Oftentimes, these register definitions are part of standard enablement provided by the SOC vendor. So that's something that we can easily leverage um, and not have to go and, and, and build ourselves. It's a, it's a lot of kind of boring code, I guess, to say, um, but, it's, but it's pretty difficult to check. Um, so if it's something that we can reuse, um, then we're definitely interested in reusing that. Um, so sort of the next thing that we get out of uh, vendor house are the what we call low-level or stateless peripheral drivers. So these, these are, are bare metal um, that oftentimes are, are, are built upon um, the kind of abstract things like if you're talking to a UART, you know, how would you set the baud rate, for example. So these are really low-level, they don't have any state, it's kind of up to the next level, either a higher-level driver or an application to manage any kind of state uh, for that peripheral. And then lastly, um, you'll see in some vendor house, um, another level called what we think of as bare metal transactional drivers. So they start to manage some of that uh, peripheral state, um, but they don't have any kind of RTOS awareness at this point. So they're not aware of any kind of threading model um, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, oftentimes these are 
Um, these tiles are maintained and provided by the SOC vendors, and so as new SOCs come out, as bugs are found, the vendors go and update um, the, these HALs. These are things that, that we don't necessarily have to maintain um, at the Zephyr project level. Typically, um, we see that these HALs are pretty permissive in terms of licensing. I think the most common one, um, there are pretty few exceptions, but most commonly we see a BSD3 clause uh, licensing model, um, which is compatible with the Apache licensing model um, that we have in Zephyr. And lastly, um, these vendor HALs are used in other projects, so they're not unique to Zephyr. And so what that means is that you can get additional maturity out of these, um, this other usage, right? So they've been tested in other contexts, um, they've been used in other ways, and so oftentimes these drivers um, have a higher maturity level and have gone through QA testing. Um, so, you know, in the particular case of the NXP drivers that we have in Zephyr, um, the, 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 the HAL level, you know, we've gone through QA testing um, before we even release those drivers to the public. So at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is simplifying the process of adding new SOCs and adding new drivers into Zephyr. So naturally, when you pull in something like this, there are trade-offs. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, having code maintained elsewhere, right? You know, I said in the previous slide that, okay, if the vendor finds a bug in the, <coughs> excuse me, you know, updates are already made by the vendor. But if, if we find at the project that perhaps there's a bug, it, it's, it's a quite a bit more difficult um, to go and update those things upstream. Um, occasionally, um, we do sometimes see licenses that aren't necessarily compatible or they're new. Um, I think the, the one case that we've seen so far is that it was just a new license to Zephyr. It wasn't something that we had seen before. It was a standard open source license. Um, but within the project, um, we do try to have new code um, under the Apache 2 license, and then um, imported code, things like HALs. We've generally accepted things like BSD3, um, but you know, if, if there's another license that we haven't seen before, then we've had to go through the process of um, working with the governing board to say, okay, is this license acceptable for the project, um, and do we want to use it? Um, and so the fact that code is used elsewhere can sometimes also be a trade-off. Um, you might find that APIs are not necessarily compatible. It then becomes difficult to use a, a, a HAL driver, a transactional driver that the, the, the vendor provided, and it just doesn't plug into the Zephyr driver model that we might have. Um, sometimes you might see that, that features might not be implemented. There's a feature that, that might be available at the API level um, within Zephyr that maybe isn't implemented um, in the lower level um, HAL driver. So, you know, we gain a lot of benefits um, from using these HALs, but, you know, there are some trade-offs. So we've had quite a bit of success using a, a pretty wide range of HALs um, across the ecosystem. Um, this is an alphabetical order, and so one thing you might notice is this is not unique to ARM either. We do see a lot of um, ARM vendor HALs that are um, all built on top of something called Simsys, which I'll cover in a minute. Um, but you also see, um, you know, the Intel QMSI, uh, you know, so we have quite a variety of HALs that we've been using successfully, um, ranging from NXP to ST to Nordic to um, pretty much, I'd say probably more SOCs than not um, are actually using these. Um, there are generally three types of abstraction um, that we see when we're using these types of HALs. So the kind of highest level abstraction would be a transactional driver, where this is the, the most amount of reuse that you would get um, from code that already exists. Um, and this is kind of the ideal case, um, I think, because it's a lot less custom code that we have to write for the project. We can leverage something that's already been built, that's already been tested. Um, and then this ends up being probably a thin the thinnest um, type of driver, at least in terms of Zephyr-specific code, that you would have to enable a particular peripheral, peripheral or API um, in Zephyr. And so this is the approach um, that we see uh, for the, what we call MCUX, which is MCU Expresso, um, that applies to NXP uh, SOCs, as well as the um, x86 uh, QMSI for the Quark. So sometimes, as I said, that you know these transactional level um, 
APIs don't necessarily make sense or aren't the most optimal. So what you sometimes see in some of the other drivers is kind of a lower level abstraction. And in this case, um, this is pretty common that you'll see it in the EST parts where we take kind of the, the stateless level drivers from the HAL or from the vendor and then build a slightly larger shim driver for Zephyr. Um, and then finally, um, kind of the lowest level abstraction um, and the least amount of reuse would be just taking register definitions only. Um, and in this case, you end up, the Zephyr driver is virtually a native driver. Um, really the only thing you're leveraging are, are things like the type def structures uh, that define the peripheral registers and their fields. And this is the approach um, that you'll see in the Atmel and the Noric drivers. So a note about SIMSYS. Um, SIMSYS stands for the Cortex Microcontroller System Interface Standard. Um, this is a standard that's defined by ARM, um, has a number of different components. Um, the, the most common one that you'll see is SIMSYS Core. Um, but there are additional components um, that I list here, uh, the system view description, DSP, driver model, things like that. Um, but, but for our case, core is what we're most interested in. Um, this is a, a standardizing the, the way that you define um, processor core access and peripheral definitions. So what happens is that um, ARM provides generic header files for their Cortex-M devices, and so you'll see a Cortex-M0 header file, a Cortex-M4 header file. And these header files um, describe all the registers that are common across that particular core. So they're not unique to any of the vendors. And then what the vendors do is they go and build on top of that. Um, they include the, the core level header file from ARM, and then they add quite a few of all the uh, peripheral definitions. So, you know, your UARTs and your I2Cs and whatever else you've included in that SOC. So we use SIMSYS in Zephyr in two different ways. So the first way is the kernel port itself. And so this is the sort of core part of, um, of Zephyr. It's, it's, it's not specific to the, any, any of the SOCs. And so what we do here is we, we, we can use SIMSYS um, register accesses to um, access the ENVIC or the SCB registers, we say and the SCB registers. And then the next method of using SIMSYS and Zephyr are, is at the driver level. And so obviously this is where sort of the SOC level, the system, the peripheral register definitions come into play. And so these are used in the, the drivers. So a little bit more detail about what is the MCU Expresso SDK. Um, you'll see an acronym um, in quite a few different places in Zephyr, um, MCUX. And so this is an abbreviation for the SDK. Um, for those of you that maybe have been around for a while, this used to be the Kinetis SDK or KSDK. Um, and when Freescale was acquired by NXP, we were merging the portfolios. We have not just Kinetis and Cortex-M device, Cortex devices, but we also had LPC um, devices, and we started creating a common enablement across all of those. And so we couldn't really call that the Kinetis SDK anymore. We started calling that the MCU Expresso SDK. So now you'll see common enablement um, across um, multiple families of SOCs from NXP. So the SDK um, provides, uh, at the very core, the, the peripheral register definitions, which are compatible with SIMSYS core. What's particularly interesting about these um, is that they're actually an artifact. Um, and what I mean by that is that we have a, a database um, where we generate the, not only the, the SIMSYS register definitions, but we also use that same database to generate our documentation. And so to me, this is a major reason to not go and write our own custom peripheral register definitions anymore because we're generating them now. Um, I think that's going to be a lot less error prone. It's used in a lot more cases. and so. Um, we very much want to leverage um, that artifact. So um, in addition, so we also have bare metal peripheral drivers. And so these, these drivers are, are, are interesting because they provide common or at least similar APIs across the different families. And what I mean by this is that we have multiple variants of the same type of IP. And so for example, um, I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with these little, little details, but I've got three different types of UARTs listed here, a UART, an LPUART, 
an LPSCI. I've got three different types of SPI modules listed here, a SPI, a DSPI, and LPSPI. So these all provide SPI and UART capabilities, but they have different register models, which means that we have different drivers for them. And so what the MCU Express OSDK does is provides a common or very similar type of driver model um, at the sort of bare, me bare metal level. Um, and what that means for Zephyr is that, you know, when we start building a shim on top of that, that shim looks pretty similar. And so if you've seen a shim for a DSPI, doing another one for an LP spy should be pretty straightforward. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, this isn't something that we incorporate into Zephyr, but I wanted to note it here, um, and that's IDE example projects. Um, and what these serve to or the purpose of these projects are to demonstrate how to use these peripheral APIs. And so, you know, if it turns out that, you know, you're stuck, you don't understand how to use it, you've got a buildable project um, using a couple of different uh, tool chains out there um, that you can go and build it, you can run it, and so you have a working example of how that driver works. And so the idea being that it would be a lot simpler if you need to go and, you know, implement um, or you need to use that driver in your own application um, you have something that, that you can leverage and, and reference. So a note about the ext folder. Um, all of the externally maintained source code in Zephyr lives in a folder at the top level called ext. And so um, as I've been talking today about, you know, SOC vendor house, um, there are additional code components that we've imported into Zephyr. Um, that also live in the X folder. So these comprise of embed TLS, TinyCrypt, FATFS, um, Segger RTT, and there may be a couple of others that I might have missed. <clears throat> in general, um, these components are permissively licensed or licensed in a way that's, that we consider compatible with Apache 2.0, but not, not, not always the same. And so I think the most common case that we see here is a BSD3 clause, um, but there are, I think, and one or two others. I think some are actually Apache 2 as well. Um, but anything we put in Ext, um, we consider sort of a, we import it as it is, we don't modify it, or we try to modify it as, as little as possible. So we, you know, this is a downstream project, it's not a forked, um, a forked repo. Um, and finally, um, anything we put in Next, uh, we have exempted from the Zephyr coding style. It just doesn't make sense to go and apply a, a, a coding style that we've adopted for sort of the core Zephyr kernel kind of components or anything that's, that's been coded specifically for Zephyr and apply that same coding standard across all of these other things that we wanted to reuse. Um, we do have a, a formal process now um, to import new code um, components into Zephyr. Um, this is a process that was um, recently approved by the governing board um, and put into practice um, in the last month or so. Um, and basically what that process consists of is um, a, documenting what that code is that you want to import, where did you get it from, um, and then having it go through first the, the TSC or the Technical Steering Committee. Um, and if the TSC um, agrees that, that this is something that we do want to use within the project, then they will send that to the governing board. Um, and then the governing board has two weeks to look it over and, and discuss any potential um, patent issues or, or things like that, that that they might have concerns with about um, importing that into the project. And so once either the governing board approves it or two weeks have passed, then um, we have the go-ahead to um, import that code into the project. So when you want to import a new component into the project, there are a number of um, things that you need to document. So obviously the origin, where did you get that project, or where did you get that code originally from? Um, why do you want to import it into the project? How are we using it? What do we want to do? with it um, and what kind of dependencies it has. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. So I wanted to kind of address a couple of questions that we commonly see um, when somebody is interested in adding a new SOC into Zephyr. Um, and so I think the first question that, that you, know, you might want to ask yourself or that you might ask, um, you know, a, a, somebody else in the community is, 
is does this SOC belong to another family or series? Um, what's really common um, in these sort of small microcontroller devices is that you'll see huge number of devices in the same family. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, you're not starting from scratch. And so take a look at what's already there in terms of Zephyr. Um, and is there something that we could extend or leverage or, um, you know, follow suit to what's already there? Um, the next question that they often get um, is, are there synthesis headers available? So if you're trying to import a new SOC into the project from a new, for a new family that doesn't already exist. So we've already established what to do for things like Kinetis or the Nordic devices or um, the Atmel devices. But if, if you've got something totally new, a new family, um, I think the first question that you'll get asked is, is are there synthesis headers available? Um, and if they are, is the license compatible? And then second, um, you know, are there driver level or are there transactional or stateless drivers available? Is there something that we can, ten, can leverage rather than starting from scratch? Um, and of course, is the license compatible? That question applies here as well. Um, oftentimes those are, are, are distributed in the same deployment. Um, that's the case for, for most of what we already have in the project. But if they happen to be separate, you need to ask that question separately. Um, are the APIs compatible? Right? So I covered the kind of three different levels of, of abstraction that you'll see. Um, and ideally, you know, can we reuse the transactional driver? If we can, great. Right? That, that, that's less new stuff that we need to do and more that we can leverage. But that's not always possible. It doesn't always make sense. Um, and so you know, maybe you bump down to the stateless level driver model. And then lastly, um, I, I touched on this a second ago, but can they be used for other SOCs in the same family? So I think this one can be a little bit tricky um, in that um, sometimes what you'll see when somebody writes a new driver, um, they'll say that that driver is you know, this particular SOC's UART driver. But in reality, you know, that same UART module exists on multiple SOC's in the same family from that vendor. And so you know, we want to be able to reuse that driver um, if we can. And so when you're importing it or when you're adding support for a new SOC in, into the project, you need to think about, you know, maybe you're not adding other SOCs in that same family yet, but maybe the next person might want to come along and do it. And so can you do it in such a way that, that, that they can leverage that work that you're doing today? So in summary, um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, we find that a lot of reuse um, and reduction in custom code um, is a major benefit to using these HALs um, when it's appropriate. You know, there are all different levels of abstraction. Um, we have had a lot of success with using these SOC HALs in Zephyr today. Um, and if you are, you know, interested in adding one yourself, um, you know, take a look at the input process, take a look at the Git history, and talk with the maintainers if you have questions. And that's it. Questions? <laughs> no. This is, uh, this is something that's, that's within NXP that we do. Uh, yeah. These are just NXP SOCs, yeah. No. No, the shim lives in the standard driver folder. Um, we consider that as, as new code to, to Zephyr, and so it, it, it lives with the rest of the, the, the sort of native code. Um, trying to think how to answer that question. I mean, so your application generally wouldn't be calling directly into the SDKs, so that should theoretically be seamless. Um, you know, in practice, I, I don't think we've seen that problem yet. Um, I, I can think of one case where, you know, it, it's something, 
the API at, in the MCU Expresso SDK actually changed in, in the Ethernet driver. It was a pretty minor change, and so I just made that change at the same time when I updated the SDK. But at the, the user level within Zephyr, right, your Zephyr application never directly calls that API. And so from, from its perspective, it, it, it was seamless. It didn't see the difference. But we don't maintain like multiple versions of the same SDK um, at one time. Anybody else? Um, I have generally updated it when I'm importing a new SOC. So we, we don't do a lot of real frequent um, releases of the MCU Express to SDK. It's generally at an SOC level. Like we don't provide, at, at, at NXP, we don't deploy an entire SDK for all of the SOCs in our portfolio. We look at it as, as an SOC by SOC basis. And so what'll happen is, you know, uh, for the K64, for example, um, in a couple of cases, I've, I've updated the SDK for that. Um, and then what, what generally happens is, you know, we added a new SOC, there were new drivers or new versions of ex existing drivers that then I went and updated. Thanks. Uh, have vendors shown any interest in uh, contributing to this uh, house living in this X directory or uh, submitting uh, updates, uh, I don't know, uh, adjusting the, this house to, to Zephyr somehow? Adjusting the house? Yeah, um. Just a just, just <laughs> question. If they've shown uh, any, any, any interest in, in contributing to Zephyr? Um, well, well I, I represent a vendor, so... Yeah. so <laughs> Other than NXP. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have seen some of the vendors. Um, you know, it, it's not just NXP that's doing that, but, you know, you had the question from Nordic there. I, th there's uh, a, somebody from, it, from ST that's also been contributing. Um, and so there has been some rep representation from the vendors on that front. When it's crap? <laughs> um, it's just awful. If it's awful. Um, the question, please. The camera. The question was, what do you do when the vendor driver is crap? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not my drivers. <laughs> um. That's a good question. I mean, I, I guess I. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I guess you know, I, I'd be interested in, in seeing if the vendor would be interested in, in fixing the driver. I think that'd be the first path I'd want to take. That's not always easy to do, um, but I'd rather at least try that first before reinventing something. Okay. Well, thank you all for, was, was there another? No, that's not a hand. <laughs> all right. Thank you for coming.